So uh, since you like the blues, I got a friend playing tonight. He's a great guitar player. Uh, he plays mainly the old school blues, but not only. And okay. you gotta check him out. He's called Laser Lloyd. He's playing we'll, Haifa tonight. Good. We'll keep we'll keep it moving here in Israel. Haifa, yeah. here we come. Well, dark clouds are rolling, and I'm a standing here in the rain. Oh, yeah. In my experience. Quality musicians recommend other quality musicians, so I'm looking forward to this. Live music is in my soul, so it was a pleasure watching and listening to him do his thing in front of an Israeli crowd. I can't wait to hear this guy's story. Got a nice, nice vibe here. Yeah, you know, I like that the Arabs and Jews get along really well here. I'm learning a lot about the lay of the land on this trip. But you get a lot of different views, a lot of perspectives. You gotta keep digging it up. Okay, let's have a conversation <laughs> in the wee hours, right? <laughs> Sometimes I lose myself. And sometimes I confuse myself. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, and we're back. Good to see everybody. Upstate Rick, what's happening? How's Nashville, bro? How's things in Smashville? I love Wednesday shows, too. Honestly, I pretty much love any chance I get to get together with all of you. Honestly, I'm very fortunate and feel really grateful that I have this, uh, this outlet. And uh, hey, Joe Frank, what's happening, man? Hope you're well, buddy. Yes, Ray Hogan. Connecticut. Yo, Connecticut's a theme in the show today, my friend. Yes. Connecticut represent. That's right. Yeah, we'll get into some Connecticut today, bro. Larry the Hunter, what's up, man? Gotta see this huge blues fan. Well, we're gonna get into the blues. We're gonna get into the blues. We're gonna get into all kinds of cool stuff today. This this guest today is uh, you know. A friend of mine, just like Vinny Stigma's a friend of mine, and you know, Roger Moret and Lou Kohler and you know Danny Schuler. Today's guest is a friend of mine. So what's happening in Lexington, Kentucky, Lee? All right. Holding it down at yeah, shout out to Toad's place. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Yep. What's this? In the middle of all this, I just got a, a new patron, Terrence Colonane. What's up, Terrence? Wow. That's a first. Wow. Uh, five minutes into it. Hey, hey, why don't the rest of you take, take Terrence's lead and join Patreon so we can and support the show <laughs> so we can keep it moving, baby. All right. Here we go. Anything? How about those Rangers tonight, huh? Who's psyched for the Ranger game? Other than me. I am. You know what? What's going on with the next four shows? Hey, you know, I want to say that 
I am getting on a plane in a couple of hours and I am coming to Berlin to do a book signing and then I'm going to screen my film and then I'm going to Israel. You know, I didn't realize it. There will not be a show. We will be back in two weeks with Satan. Ruler of hell, swallower of souls, creator of rock and roll will be on the show. This is the first time ever. Two weeks. Wednesday, June 22nd, Jeff, Jeff Altieri from Enrage, Mike Scandato and Joe James from Inhuman. They're playing the Barry Electric on June 26th. Talking about that. Then the, then the big banger, the 200th episode, Mr. Evan Seinfeld will be on the show. And then Wednesday, June 29th, finally we got Bob Riley to come on. So lots going on. In the meantime, here is photo of the day. Yes, Siri, photo of the day. There it is. And there, and there he is. <laughs> What's up? What's going on? Oh, uh, it's still it's still stinging. I'm in the parking lot of Twin Moon Creations in Glen Head. And uh, that is my arm about five minutes ago, actually. Let's, let's see it. Let's see it in uh, real time. It's, uh, let's see if you can see it there. It's, uh, it's kind of that, a bad How does that work? Twist. How does that work? You go into the tattoo shop and you're like, yo, I want to get on my wrist. The, the, what is that called? The spindle? That's a, that's a 45 adapter right there. You know, that's, yo, I uh, want a 45 adapter on my arm. I actually brought her an actual 45 adapter, Is that my right? friend Cindy, and she said, can I have this? And I said, of course you can have it. And the two guys behind the counter didn't even know what it was. And I was like, man, like, are you not of it? Like, cause Cindy is a dear friend of mine. She's done nine of my, she's done 10 of my Who tattoos it, already Cindy? now. Cindy, Cindy, uh, Twin Moon Creation. She's done a bunch of stuff for the Gallo brothers. Got she's it. uh she's been around for many many years and uh twin moon used to be in floral park and now it's in glenhead and i absolutely just love her work and uh she's done a bunch of my stuff and and i've always you know like to me that little 45 adapter means a lot it, it the vinyl the music it has a certain sentimental value it's to heavy it. man it's, it's a 45 man. adapter. Speaking, That's right. speak, speaking of heavy, how about photo of the day? Boom. Right. There we go. There we go. Wrong answers only, please. Photo of the day. Um, Larry, uh, um, Larry the Hunter, maybe you have a clue. <laughs> nah. That guy on stage looks an awful lot like you. So is it? Is it, hey, guys, shout out from Fredericksburg, Texas? Is it, <laughs> what's up, Joe Romini, shouting out Joe and, and everyone at the Texas Silver Rush? You know what? We'll do Texas Silver Rush in a bit. Is it Bob Marley? That. Is it, that's a sick picture? There you go. Is it Ziggy Marley? Ha. Is it the repeat offenders? It is the repeat offenders. <laughs> Yep. That good that looks he looks like he's hitting a painful note right there. Oh. <laughs> oh. All right. You know what? Being that the whole band is kind of up in this picture, let let's just let's is it Queen? Is it Dave <laughs> Math? Is it Dave Matthews? Is it no redeeming social value? Nah. You know what? Why don't you tell us what this is? Let's jump right into it. This is our good friends in Kings Never Die. And this was taken uh, the other night at The Chance in Poughkeepsie, uh, which was a, 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 a tremendous show. It was Kings Never Die, uh, Sub-Zero, and, of course, Life of Agony. Uh, actually, in a band called Exhale, the demon opened up. But uh, these guys, just a killer, killer band. And um, I'll be seeing them again this Friday at the Warsaw, in fact, in Brooklyn. Um, just, just killing it. They got some. They got a new record, and uh, just, just, just a fun band. I mean, Larry the Hunter, you know, Dan the Stasi, Danny Schuler, of course, on drums. And uh, can't beat that with a baseball bat. 
a powerhouse. Just, you know, and uh, you talk yeah. about Danny jump, Danny joining that band. It, it's like, it was like putting a new engine in the car, you know? Yeah, like, for sure. You know, and they've yeah. just been killing it. And the new material sounds so good. They have that new song, Rally, which is great. And uh, they just played actually last night. It Was it last night or the night before at the Debonair, which I didn't make it to? That was Monday, Memorial Day. Yeah. And uh, but I will be there Friday for uh, for the show. Hey, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. Are you in an Uber? No, I'm, I'm in my car. <laughs> Are you driving? No, no, no. I'm parked. I'm parked. <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm in Glen Head here, so I'm parked in the parking lot. Talk Got about it. making it down to the wire. When I texted you, I, I'm like, I might be late. And we got done and wrapped up and out the door by 3 o'clock sharp. So, you know. Hey, I want, I, I want uh, to shout out Danny Schuler and his, um, I don't know how to say. Let's just say Evan Seinfeld's coming on the show soon. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if it's right to say ex-bandmate, current bandmate, soon to be band again mate. bandmate. We'll see. Do you, do, do you know how insane that will be? Oh. What, a biohazard if, reunion? Yep. And if anyone can make it happen, true can. Talk about tales from the hard side. Hard side. Oh man, that's going to be awesome. But Danny, you know what? Danny is Danny's awesome. Got to talk to him a little bit the other night and super psyched to see them again Friday. You'll be away, right? So, yo, my female unit is coming to the show on Friday. Oh, nice. Awesome. Rochelle will be representing. <laughs> I'll be in I'll be in Berlin or on my way to Israel. Uh, actually, no, Friday I'll be no, Friday I'll be I'll be doing um the book signing. Oh, nice. You would at Quintex. Actually, for those that may not be in the know, I will be doing this. I will be in Berlin this Friday signing copies of my book. Can't say it's my new book. It's been out nice. for a while. But that's happening this Friday at the Cortex store in Berlin at 6 p.m. That's a really cool flyer, by the way, I must say. Whoever did that, that's awesome. Uh, uh, Cortex did it. So, all right. I'm psyched for Laser Lloyd, you know, just awesome. Yeah, Love that you know, guy. Got to, I got to meet him at the first premiere of the movie, and uh, yep. this is going to be a great episode. Absolutely. Come check in later. I'll be back in a little hey, bit. This is, yo, this is the, yo, we're not doing it. This is two, after this will be two weeks before the next show. Yeah, that's, that's nuts. That's never happened. That's nuts. I'll, I'll accumulate a lot of pictures in the meantime. Accumulate. Accumulation. <laughs> I'm the accumulator. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a super villain. The accumulator. Beware the accumulator. Ah. <laughs> All right. I'll see you later. Peace. Peace in the Middle East. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing. Grunge and Grime Soap Company, and the Texas Silver Rush. It's a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres that design and create unique one-off pieces as well as style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famous Greg Rolay, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram page, and of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Also want to mention that the Organic Grill, I saw Vlad yesterday, and they're gearing up to reopen. Should be about a week or so, although I don't believe that. They're going to be at 133 3rd Street on the corner of 6th Avenue, right next to the Blue Note. As soon as they're back happening, we'll get Vlad out here and we'll do some 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 jive in with him how about dtfm vinyl distro it's a record store that specializes in underground music punk ska hardcore metal and more located in the heart of fargo north dakota's industrial district shop in person or online at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com where the motto is death to false metal come on now last but not least grunge and grime soap company their modern day soap company with a rock and roll spirit 
inspired by the music that we grew up with. Music is in our soul. You too? From 80s hair metal to 90s grunge and everything in between, we believe in being true to yourself no matter who pop culture tells you to be. www.grungeandgrime.com. That said, let's clear the deck. Let's bring our guest on. Yo, what's up, Larry Kelly? What's up, Chucky? Oh, you just dropped me a text? Hey, I don't have my phone. My phone's actually... So everybody that waits until I start doing a show to start sending me messages, I don't have my phone right now. <laughs> so there you go. Um, is it? Is this? This is already better than that god awful pistol show. You know, I was going to reach out to Leiden <laughs> about that, but I decided it's best to not like not bother him with it. He's probably friggin' pissed. I bet Leiden is pissed. You know, it is kind of lame, but whatever. That said, let's clear the deck and let's bring our guest on. Here we go. Today's guest is an American singer, songwriter, and guitarist hailing from Madison, Connecticut. His music is a mix of acoustic and electric Americana, rock, folk, blues, psychedelic styles with lyrics touching on life, love, and struggle. He's known for his work with the bands The Last Mavericks, Yehud, Reva La Shiva, and of course The Trail he has blazed as a solo artist. He is one of the centerpieces of my new film, The Jews in the Blues, that I directed along with my brother Evan B. Stone and executive produced by Arnold Stone. Please welcome, coming at us from Bet Shemesh, Israel, in the Middle East, I am thrilled and honored to have him on the show, Mr. Laser Lloyd. Brother! Drew! that little riff there i was writing it as you and steve were cracking me up man i was loving it how are you buddy i was loving that your bro there hanging out has brought me back to good memories from the island hey tilt <laughs> tilt up a little bit if you can so we could see hey that's hey. good hey i got i got your uh i got your yamaha here ah that's the guitar <laughs> bro it's either that or lagrange guitars <laughs> all right Listen, let, let's 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 jump into it. All right, brother. What's the latest? How you doing? You know, how, how's the how's the uh, how the zombie apocalypse pick? You know, uh, treat you like what's the latest, baby? So good, right here. This is the best best it's ever been. You know, it's uh, you know the cra the crazier the world gets, the deeper it pushes us inside to really tap into our own true blues. And uh, I'm just feeling uh, very blessed where life is great. The music's going well, you know, juggling family, parents, kids, grandkids, uh, new albums, new songs, new, uh, you know, nice uh, things. We had a new thing we just did with a new unbelievable singer, Rachel Selfin. I'm playing with this new guy, Gaddy. All these new things, people are coming and we got new guitars coming from the Grange Guitars, where they yeah chose me to yeah be Ray, the Ray Hogan's asking uh, make and model of that. Yeah, this is the Lagrange. It's called the Sultan. It's the best Strat I've ever played, and uh, you know I got millions of views on a few years ago with my big songs, um, Tears for Dikla and uh, Forget the World. They all were on the Grange Guitars, and so. We got big news coming up with them. They're coming out with a new model and this model. And so I just, the sound is incredible. You know, I was just. Wow. Okay. Good. <laughs> what, um, did you grow up in a musical household? Uh, tell us about, you know, how did music come into your life? Where did you come up? With, did you grow up in a musical household? Yeah, my dad was uh, a huge music fan. He he didn't he did it like when he was studying in Columbia University. He had a folk duo. It was called Tipper T 
two, Tipper Canoe and Tyler two. <laughs> you know, it was just about the times when, uh, right before, it was just about when, when Paul Simon was looking for uh, Art Garfunkel, my dad was big on the folk scene in the college. But since I grew up, all I remember is every weekend, our, our weekends were going to the jazz fests, you know? I remember being like six, seven, and my father taking me to get like a hug from Dizzy Gillespie. He, Dizzy would blow up his cheeks like this wide, and you know, and, and so that was my that was my life. And and Dad always had like, you know, he would have Jerry Jeff Walker, Chris Christopherson, he would have uh, Dave Brubeck, and then all the blues, BB King, blasting in the house. You know, Dad would come home from work. I'd hear he'd go to the bar. He wouldn't drink too much, but I would hear the 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 ice drop, and all of a sudden, that's it. He's got the jazz, or he's got the blues. He's got some cool country music or James Taylor on the thing. And so I was just from a very age. It was music was a big part of it. And Dad had it played a little folk guitar. So we had this. It was called Goya from Sweden. He had this little Goya classical folk guitar. You are, and that was my sure. first guitar. And I was just hooked, you know, from the very beginning. You know, he would write songs to us, and we would sing, sit around. But I just remember throwing frisbees around and just and, going and you, jazz you, festing. You you grew you grew up in Connecticut, correct? Half my life New Jersey, Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, and then since then half my life Madison, Connecticut. Yeah. Wow, Madison, Connecticut. Yeah. How did you have? Uh, Ray, I heard Ray you guys Hogan. talking about Toad's place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, Ray Hogan, who lives up in Stanford, says, "Did you have a blues epiphany?" You know, I did. I tell you what it is. I was fourteen, and at that time, I knew about like my bass player had got me heavy into Jeff Beck, and uh, I was into you know the Rolling Stones, Neil Young. But then my dad, I had started to hear on the radio Stevie Ray Vaughan. Stevie Ray Vaughan started coming, I guess, like, 83 on the radio. You know, WPLR in New Haven was playing it. And so uh, my dad took me to see uh, Stevie Ray at the Lincoln Theater. John Hammond was having a night of all, all the artists that he got involved wow. with. Wow. So I was like a 14-year-old kid. My dad had just recently bought me my first electric guitar from Manny's. It was a Fender Lead 3 with an acoustic it's called acoustic amp, like that is Albert that, King. Is, is that this? There it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Look at I that smile. I remember me and dad Look went into the train station. Face, man. That's awesome. Yeah, 48th Street, Manny's music. And so the next time dad took me on the train, he says, we're going to see a show. So he didn't want to tell me what's going on. So I'm sitting there. It's okay. We're up at this fancy Lincoln Theater. And... Everyone's sitting really like, uh, how do you call it? It's kind of sophisticated there. And then one guy's playing, and I think George Benson came. And then all of a sudden, ladies and gentlemen, you haven't heard of him yet, but double Stevie Ray Vaughan in double trouble. He comes on. I'm telling you, from the first note, I jumped out of my seat. Daddy couldn't grab me. <laughs> and I ran to the front of the stage. Everybody's sitting, and I'm sitting there looking up for 20 minutes watching Stevie and I I I mean every note he played would just shot through my soul. I mean, he was bringing all the best of Freddie King, Albert King, Jimi yeah. Hendrix, but he had it in his own way. He had a super really good vibe. You could tell he was he had something and and that's it. From that day on, I was that's it. I was that's it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it comes up in the in my film uh, is that, you know, uh, Freddie King is to Stevie Ray Vaughan as to Albert King is to Eric Clapton. You know, is that? Yeah, there's yeah, a, there's, yeah, yeah. there's a big, you know, li lineage. Yeah, of uh, course, excuse, all of them. But, you know, was no, just, no, he Clap opened up the gates for all of yeah. us to know about the blues. Like, people yeah. don't know, but in 1983, Buddy Guy and B.B. <laughs> King, they were not really working. They were struggling. Yeah. yeah. Eric Cla all these people... I mean, when Stevie Ray broke through, he would write on the albums every one of the idols that helped him. And he all of a sudden put blues back on the map. 
I yeah, mean, people he did. would say he wasn't a blues purist, but he put the blues back oh, on the map. Oh, come on. Yeah. Anybody who's... <laughs> Blues, well, no, yeah, I mean, he went into the Jimmy I mean, Hendrix I mean, I guess, he the- I guess, I guess people could say he wasn't a purist, but it's Well, he there, wouldn't man. argue with that. He, he, to his benefit, they wanted him to cross over, and he was made to cross over. He's a rock yeah. and roll soul, too. And so, but I remember I got to see him three times live, and I mean, it was... It yeah, was, I, got, I, was, I, I got it backwards. It's it's Freddie King is to Eric Clapton as exactly Albert King, as Albert yeah, King. I don't, I don't want to say anything because yeah, yeah, people, yeah, yeah. No, that's all, that's it's important. All, it's all the same. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's important. Our good friend Chris Contos, who uh, uh, who played drums in Machine Head, says my dad produced Doctor John and John Hammond triumphant record. That's a great wow, record. Wow, those are some big records. Those yeah. I remember seeing Doctor John in the city, and I and that night John Hammond was also playing there. He came I out saw with Do- the National I saw, Steel Guitar. I saw Dr. John open up for Jerry, the Jerry Garcia Band at the Capitol Theater in New Jersey in like 1980. And Dr. John came out, you know, with the voodoo stick and the whole headdress and everything. And I was like, what is this? It the was, dude was off the charts. Oh, it was great. He, he opened up with Ico Ico. It, 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 was, it, it, was really, it was really great. Oh, yeah. so, so, you know, just one more thing about this photo. Is that like my my? Correct me if I'm wrong, but this feels like this is a basement in Connecticut. <laughs> that is my keyboard player and and second guitar player Paul Shalaba. That was his parents' basement where the Legacy Band we would do our rehearsals. There's a little PVPA there in the background. My my best buddy Danny. Babino, that there's his drums. I just spoke to Danny the other day, yesterday, in fact. There's his drums, and yeah, that's where we made the magic. We would, we would, uh, we would, you know, in the we were doing like '60s revival Elvis. We would slick our hair back. To, the drummer's father was the manager, so at age 16, Legacy Band, we were already on. We were already playing professionally. You know what I'm saying? Is this is this the Legacy? Uh- that the what world renowned who who crushed it at the battle of the bands at Daniel Hand <laughs> High School, huh? <laughs> it is. I remember. You know, I, I got the bug that day. We did light my fire. You know, and uh, I, that was a point in my life. I was a big athlete. I was playing sports, and I was also music. And I kind of was like a little bit of a loner because for the for the for the athlete for the jocks i was a little bit too artsy and Mm. for the artsy people i was like i was into the sports so people didn't really know me too well and then the whole school comes to see and we're playing light my fire and there i just let loose on the guitar solo and i remember the people just kept going cheering and i kept going and i remember getting home after that and i remember the feeling i don't think i slept for three days and i just from then on i said that's it Lighting people up with the music is like I, you know, that's 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 all. That's what it's about. And this this shot is about around that time, maybe a year or two later. This is right before I got showcased by Atlantic Records. No, that was in high school. This is right after college. This is nineteen eighty nine. Right. This is right after Skidmore College, where I studied music, and this is right when. I made The Last Mavericks, which was my band on the shoreline with my own original music, which was like, it was before Nirvana. It was like Stevie Ray Vaughan meets Bruce Springsteen, Johnny Cash with like Nirvana. They didn't know what it was, but I was playing like this grunge type of Stevie Vaughan. And I remember the guy from Atlantic Records, he said, he's like, well, we don't know what that music is really. It's like, there's a lot of, what is that? And I'm saying, I don't know, it's just me. He, and then they'd say, well, can we just, they wanted to take one of the songs, says, can you make us 13 of these songs? And I was like, dude, <laughs> who, how do we do? So, you know, that was my first taste of music. And, 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 so, and that, that was, that, so, so wait, look, let me, let me, let me, let me uh, double back a second. Uh, you went to Skidmore College and you studied on, with Randy Brecker and, and Milt Hil- Hil- um, Hilton? They were my, right? they were my summer jazz teachers. They would come ah. in and do like master classes. Milt Hinton was a huge influence on me. He was like a grandfather type figure. He would come for the summer with his wife and he loved me because my dad grew me up on Kenny Burrell 
And so I was kind of like, when I would play jazz, I would play very minimal, you know what I'm saying? So Stevie Ray made that famous, but sure. so I just love the feel of, so I would play very minimal and Milt Hinton had this big smile the first time he heard me, and he says, he comes over, he says, Lloyd, I want you to know <laughs> that you're going to make a lot of money if you play jazz, because I want you to know that nobody likes guitar players because you don't, guitar players, that never shut up. But I see you're only playing what's needed. Mm. And I want to tell you something, Lloyd. Remember this, on the stage and off the stage, if you do more listening than talking, you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and that that really was a big thing for me. That was the first, that really had a huge influence on me, not just about the music, but the listening. You know, I, it was. And I, I know also just through our friendship and, and a lot of our discussions that B.B. King had a huge influence on, on on you as well. And it wasn't so much his playing, but it was sort of his overall ethos as far as uh, being in a band goes. Could you explain that to us? Yeah, I always felt good vibes from B.B. King. When I saw him live, I saw him in New Haven. I, you just felt from the guy, this is not a guy who wants to get people to clap for him. This is a blues healer. I always felt that when I used to watch Lightning in Hopkins, that he was a real mystical character, that they were doing healing with the music. That's what they were really doing. The ones who really understood that there's people suffering, people in the mundane world working hard, and you're going there and you got to get people out of their head. And so I felt that about B.B. King. But until then, I was practicing hours and hours a day with Wes Montgomery, all the Stevie Ray riffs, going through all the Jeff Beck. And then I saw Master Class with B.B. King. And this story really changed my life. They asked B.B., they said, B.B., what's the secret? You got 17 guys in your band. They're together 35 years. <laughs> and you never changed anybody in the band. And here you got these rock bands, six, seven years, three people, and they're already breaking up and they can't stand each other. How did you keep 17 people in an old stuffy bus for 35 years, you never changed anyone. He said, well, I want to tell you, when someone would tell me that they wanted to, that I should have someone join the band that they could really play, I never went to hear them play. I would sit them down at the bar. We would have a few drinks. And after a few drinks, I could tell if they were good people, mm. I could make them into good musicians. And so really there, something all of a sudden, the switch went off where I said, oh, my goodness, you know, I never really delved into what does it really mean. <laughs> I mean, I had just started studying the Buddhists, get more college, but I never really went into the depth of that. What is it really that the focus has to be on being a good person? And that's really is supposed to be the vessel to hold the music. And, and you know what I'm saying? And so that became yeah. my focus. And yeah. I really felt that from B.B. King. He, he really was... I've heard, I always like to get stories from people actually met and backstage and personal stories. You just can't imagine how many unbelievable great stories you can get about B.B. King and what kind of person he was, you know? Yeah, and there's a lot of great musicians out there that are twiddling away in their garage because they can't really, you know, uh, you know, uh, jibe with other musicians and they can't play in the sandbox with the other guys. I mean, I, yeah. you know, amazing, amazing, amazing musicians, but within sort of a social and group setting, they, you know, so it's kind of how, how it, how it shakes out. So, so you, 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 you pull together the last Mavericks and is, is this, and I, I see sort of a, 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 a things are sort of changing. Is this a last uh, Maverick shot? No, that is actually many years after. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll come. We'll come back to that. I always thought that, that was is the first. That's in two thousand four. Oh. That is the first. 
time I recorded the Laser Lloyd album in 2004. Ah, okay. But for now, La Last Mavericks, w w what happened? So um, you guys you guys get rolling, and, and you're, a, you're playing the circuit out of Connecticut? Well, yeah, we're playing the shoreline in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And um, it was interesting. It does, it's an interesting story. The, the uh, other guys in the band, Paulie's had a Junior's Music. It was in Clinton, Connecticut. He was the... And I came back, and he's played bass for me. And I had my best buddy playing drums, who I thought was the best drummer in the world, from the legacy band, Danny Bambino. But he was really blown away by this new metal drummer who was, like, teaching, and he could play heavy metal double bass. I tried to tell the dude, I said, I, really, that's talent, but that's not really, that's not the style I'm doing. Anyway, yeah. he, we ended up, this guy played the drums, and... I, I in the recording studio I was able to make it the kind of music I wanted, not too much double bass heavy metal, even though that yeah. has its thing, but that wasn't who I was. But right. so when I showcased for Atlantic Records, they're like, Wow, we really love your songs and your presence and your singing. But they told me we're gonna you're, we want you to do the singer songwriter thing. We're not gonna use that band. And so right. that was kind of hard. And so then they moved me into Manhattan and they started having me make a few demos. Um and, uh, you know, I was uh, making some demos for them and we, we were doing it. And uh, did, did you feel did you feel at this point a little bit like you were getting caught up in the stream, like the machine, the machinery was sort of dictating life decisions? I mean, I'm looking down the road here a little bit. But at that point, it, did you feel a little bit like you, you're sort of you, the current was taking you? Yeah, I remember going up in this big... I was with my manager at that time, Frank Bashinsky. He was my, a good buddy who was the manager. And uh, we didn't know anything about the music business. And we're like, wow, showcase Atlantic Records. You're making a demo. They started yeah. saying they want to send me down with Gary Talent was the bass player of the E Street Band. And right. he started... That was when Nashville started becoming more than country. It started becoming other things. And they wanted me to go down and, 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 produce, and be produced in Nashville. I remember going up to the office all the way to the floor, meeting Toby Moffitt in the AR department with the, the cassette tape. We just made the greatest demo in the world where they sent this off. It was somewhere in like in Wilton, Connecticut, where, where Keith Richards lives. Some guy had a fancy studio. And we walk in and I play him. I said, wow, you're going to love this. I made this awesome intro to this song. Best guitar intro ever. But it's like a 30 second intro. I remember after seven seconds, the guy pushes the forward button. I'm like, wait a second, what are you doing? He's like, listen, it's seven seconds. I don't I don't hear a hit yet. <laughs> I said, what? Well, hold on, we didn't get to that. <laughs> and the manager's looking at me like, like, what the hell? I remember leaving the room and saying, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oof. The, the machine. <laughs> yeah. So so they, they, they wanted to send you down to Nashville with Gary, Gary Talent from the E Street Band. Um, yeah, and and at the time, so I, I, not only they did me, I went and I went with my buddies. We I we were looking at places where they said, "Listen, this type of music, you got to break it from down south. This is not a thing to break from New York City. Ah. You're singing like really good, deep American music. You you can't. This isn't from you." So I had buddies down in Carolina. We went down to the Carolinas. I had a day job at this point. I was a uh, Already working in New York City, moved in there, had a day job, was playing at night, you know, Manny's Car Wash, yeah, yeah. all the places, the sure. singer-songwriters in Greenwich Village singing, yeah, yeah. and then... Uh, the Bitter End and all that? Yeah, and I, and I, I we found a place. We, okay, we found a place. I put a deposit on a place down in the Carolinas, and we're going to do... go. We're gonna, that's going to be where we're going to break it. We decided this is a good area. It was near Wilmington, a big, big music city uh -huh. and a big place. It's like John Mayer. You know, John Mayer's music from Connecticut, but he really broke it a few years in Atlanta. He went down to focus in Atlanta after he left Berkeley Music, the same kind of thing. He told them, okay, okay. And so that's just when I was in the city hanging out in Central Park. I was a long-haired hippie, you know, feeling good. And, uh, you know, I, all of a sudden I meet this homeless beggar and this dude says he hangs out with this rabbi next thing i know i'm playing a concert with this this guru hippie rabbi called shlomo kalibach so wait so you met so you meet this homeless guy in central park 
And he's you know and he's, the, so you know the there's the fountain in Central Park, right? Yeah, the, Beth the Bethesda fountain. Yes, fountain. I know. It. You got reggae music. You got. I know it, it well. smells like pot. Yes, you know, real good course. pot. People uh -huh. are doing their rollerblading, and it was this old dude going around the fountain. He looked like Ed Koch at age eighty. He had uh -huh. a long green raincoat on, no <laughs> shoes. He goes to everybody, and he's he has a little bowl. He says, "Make a wish. Don't tell mama. Whatever you put in, you get back a hundred thousand times." Wow. That's his gig. So when I came from Connecticut, listen to this. When I came from Connecticut, Drew, I was sheltered a little bit. And I was used to just saying hi to everybody. That's just the way I was raised. My parents were like Abraham's tent. Everybody was in our house. If someone had a problem, they were living in my basement. My parents were in, were involved with the ABC. I, I like that. Abraham's tent. I like that. It, awesome. it was like it was no, it really was a better. They were involved with this. A better chance. Kids from the city would come to school and live at our house. They became my brothers until this uh -huh. day. If my parent and my friends, my buddy Danny had some problem with his parents, they would live at our house. So I would, but I was just like nice to everybody. You know, my parents, when I moved to New York, they said, listen, we know you, this isn't nice to say, but you have to be careful. You can't speak to homeless people. They said, maybe they're on drugs. Maybe it's dangerous. You don't know. They just knew that maybe... I would I would be a little naive, and I was naive. Yeah, right. For some reason, I decided to speak to this guy, and he starts telling me this whole thing. We start speaking. He tells me he where he sleeps on the street, thirty eighth Street and Seventh Avenue. There's this synagogue that this rabbi gives him five bucks and a bagel, and he just has to help make the the Jewish people need ten people to make their prayer service. Yes. Anyway, we spent the whole day. I invited him to my house. I get, let him shower, bought him food. And he says, come and check it out. So I'm this long-haired kid. Now, I knew I was Jewish, but barely, because my parents would take me out to Long Island to my aunt's house on the Jewish holidays. But we, I grew up very, very secular, you know what I'm saying? Right. Mm -hmm. Even though Laser's my Hebrew name, like my mother would, lay, would yell out, Laser Pinchas, that was only when I did something bad, she would pull out the Jewish name. Right. Anyway, I end up meeting this rabbi. I said, Rabbi, I only know really about the blues. I don't know any Jewish music. He wants to make a concert with me. I got it on video, the whole concert. He's like, don't worry, I also play the blues. I said, really? He says, yeah, I play the Jewish blues. You play your blues, I'll play my blues. So I get there. The guy <laughs> blew me away. It was the deepest, first of all, it was the deepest music I ever heard. It had just similar chords. Mm -hmm. But the thing that blew me away is my favorite note from B.B. King all the time is, you know, bro, it's the flat five. You know, that's the note, the flat five. Straight straight out of the B.B. King playbook. It just that's that's that was why B.B. King got me. It was so deep. Yeah. So he's singing songs and I'm hearing the flat five. He's right. singing these songs like so I'm like, wow, this is really bluesy. And I was playing my, you know, Stevie Ray riffs and he was loving it. He was like, wow, no one's ever played these riffs in a synagogue. And so after the show, I tell him, I said, Rabbi, I said, who wrote those songs with the flat five? <laughs> <laughs> So he says, hey, brother, you know, Shlomo Carla has a New York guy. He says, hey, brother, I know about flat tires. I don't know about flat five. What are you talking about? Right. So, <laughs> so, 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 so Rabbi Carly Bach, he wasn't particularly musically trained. He, he was just, he was all a, a feel guy, huh? He was a feel guy. He knew yeah. a few chords. Right. He knew a lot of songs and he yeah. deeply connected. He could sure. do deep, deep music, but he couldn't explain it too much. Sure. Sure. But so I said, I said, who who wrote the tune with the flat five? You, you made a few tongues. He says, so he says he doesn't know what it is. So I had to sing it to him. He says, oh, that's the Baal Shem Tov. I said, ah, I said, Rabbi, I got to meet him. He says, no, <laughs> you don't want to meet him. He's been dead soon. for 200 he, years. <laughs> he died before 250 years ago. Right. <laughs> so I was like this, this kind of like burst my bubble. Of because here I was, I thought I found the most deepest thing, which was black blues music with this flat five. Right. And he tells me that 250 years ago the Jews are doing this. And then 
it took I had to go meet some of my black buddies who were playing the klezmer music. People didn't understand that the klezmer was big into the jazz, and they told yeah. me, "Yeah, lazy, you don't know, man. If you want to really play the blues, you gotta go back to the Jews." <laughs> Yeah. And here I am. I'm trying to get away. I didn't see anything that could be spiritual about the Jews where I grew up. And uh, and so anyway, it was it was so he Slomo Kovac says, you got to come play with me in Israel. And I'm here. I'm in the middle of my thing. I just put a deposit on a condo to go move down south. I just made these demos. I said, brother, I ain't going to Israel. That's war. And have you, uh, at that point, were you ever, have you ever been to Israel at that point? I had gone eight days to visit my sister. Mm. She was teaching uh, English to Ethiopian people on a kibbutz. Mm. She, and and uh, my mother, you know, I never had a Jewish girlfriend or, or, or a, I never really had a white girlfriend. Dating so shiksas your whole life. My mother, my, whole life, my huh? mother I think she was worried <laughs> that, you know, uh, they, my parents weren't prejudiced, but I think they, they wanted me to at least get a chance to meet someone Jewish. Right, right. Anyway, my mother said, go visit your sister. So I, 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 at this point, I had gotten a taste of Israel, but I never thought I would move there. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And then Shlomo Kalibach says, you got to play with me there. And I said, let's try it. And then, you know, then he introduced me to some deep people. So, so you, go to, you go to Israel. Uh, 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 did, did you play with him in Israel? So he tells me to no, I have a, I have the video of me playing with him in Manhattan. Right, because I think I know how this. I know, I, know how this, I know how this shakes out. Go ahead. So he gets at this at this at this show. He introduces me to a son of some rabbi who has this yeshiva, which is a place of Jewish learning in like this Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in Jerusalem. He says, "I spoke to my dad. You can go hang out there, play your guitar, and just wait for Shlomo to come." So I go there. They give me this room in this real simple apartment. And I'm hanging out there. And one day the rabbi comes in. You know, I was playing on the roof, my guitar, every day, long hair. And the rabbi comes in and says, I don't think you're going to be playing with Shlomo Kalibach because he died on the plane the other day. Wow. So that's it. So I was like, oh, man. Whew. And here you are in Israel. I was already there, and I had made some connections. So I said, "You know what? I, some people had started hearing the blues, and I spoke to the people from Atlantic Records. He was kind of shocked when I told him I'm. I think I might hang out in Israel. He <laughs> said, "Wow." He said, "But you know what?" He said, "That might be a big, might be an interesting story that will set you apart from other people." Mm -hmm. That's not the reason I stayed, but. Whatever it is, I had to get the depths of my blues. And then, you know, that was that was heavy years. That was years when, you know, Israel was trying to make peace with uh with uh, Yasser Arafat and I was I was in Jerusalem and, and buses were blowing up. Just you know, Israel signs this peace treaty, Oslo, and then it's just like today. Hamas today is making all these terror attacks because People don't speak about it, but the Israeli government, the Knesset, they have now a whole Muslim party that they incorporated into the government. So it's the same thing. The fanatical people yeah. are scared that, you know, there'll be normalization, that a lot of yeah. these Muslims will be saying, wait a second, this ain't apartheid. This ain't bad people. We're in the government. Right. So it was the same thing that was happening. So these were heavy blues. I mean, I, I really was exposed to really heavy stuff that was so did you, know. you so did you start at that point did you sort of launch your your solo career and did you start woodshedding and just playing and playing and playing in israel so what i did is i first i got introduced it i started writing some of my own music which was you know uh slow-mo kalibak meets you know stevie ray vaughn and then someone introduced me to this really cool band. It was a Grateful Dead band that played Shlomo Kalibach music. It was called Reva Lesheva, which means wow. a quarter to seven, <laughs> which kind of infers that we're at the time of the, of the world where let's do it. It's time to open up the gates, redemption for everyone. And so we started touring around the world with this band, Reva Lesheva. And I learned a lot. It was a beautiful music. It was really exposing to a lot of different people. But I still was working on my own solo project. 
And then in 2004, one of the famous Israeli musicians heard me and he said, oh, my God, you're living in Israel. I got I want to I got to produce an album for you. So he produced me an album in 2004, the first Laser Al Lloyd album. It's still one of my favorites. It's called Higher Ground. Mm -hmm. Soon we're going to be releasing it. We got finally I had lost. There was one debt when we made the last Mavericks um, demo. It was on a D.A.T. And I remember it got stuck in a buddy's machine and we couldn't <laughs> find anyone to fix it, to even open up the machine. Oh, my God. So all that I had left was dad found eventually some cassette tape of the demo that he finally mm. got me. And I gave it to my manager, Yo, in Chicago. So soon we're going to be releasing the first last, the last Mavericks. It was never released. Wow. And how yeah. and how does uh, you you you'd? Yud. So Yud was also, after the Laser Lloyd album, I had some other buddies. I was writing the music to this. I had a buddy who wanted to go a little heavier. My friend uh, Yaakov from Canada, he was really into like Alice in Chains and a little bit heavier cream. And sure. so we made this real power trio that just took off around the world. We did two unbelievable albums that was like, Really, uh, I'm really proud of it. It was some of my favorite music. It was kind of like the James Gang meets um, Hendrix with Alice in Chains. And like before, what was his name? Uh, Lenny Kravitz. It had Lenny, a lot of yeah. Lenny Kravitz group. And we, that started going big. We were touring. It, it was huge. Well, touring. Well, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned Cream. And looking at it, it was you were a three piece, so I guess that that makes sense for the for the cream comparison. It's like a power trio. It was a power trio, but it had a lot of like a Jimmy, like the Jimi Hendrix experience. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, and it was very powerful. This unbelievable drummer, Moshe Yankowski, was this Russian drummer who he would just every note I would do, he would just be relating to it. It's not, it's it was something special. But, you know, I realized as life goes, uh, Yaakov was a very deep guy. He decided to go back and finish his, to become a psychiatrist in Canada. And so <laughs> that ended that project. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to just do it under my own name. Shlomo told me that I have to use the name Laser. He said, he, called, he started calling me Laser from the beginning. I told him, Rabbi, my name is Lloyd. Because my Jewish name was Laser. He said, I know. But you ain't going to be able to get rid of the laser. You don't have to get rid of Lloyd, but no matter what, you, you're stuck with laser. Right. So, so I just started using the laser Lloyd. People think it's like a made-up name, but that's my given at birth Jewish name together with my given at birth American name. And that's the history of it. So I said, you know what? I don't want to have to rely on any band members anymore. I said, I'm just going to do my own project, Laser Lloyd. Uh, I missed that Telecaster. I had to uh, yeah, so I many just guitars. About, I, was I had to, to. I was about to ask you, nice Telecaster. That's early seventies that I got from this. I had buddies way back. There used to be this Memphis Blues Museum, and mm. they would have a little guitar store there. And I was living in Manhattan, and the guy every time he get something that was beaten up or he couldn't sell, but was really good, he would say, "Hey, ladies, <laughs> I'm gonna tip you up something," <laughs> and then I would fix it. <laughs> That's and, great. But, you know, That's I was, great. I had five kids. I was making music. Sometimes I had to always sell one of my guitars. That guitar I had to sell. It killed me. Yeah, we 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 all have those. You know, uh, Mickey Mickey Damron says would love to see Laser put a box set together. Oh, Mickey, one of my best brothers. I last saw him in Kentucky over the Cincinnati border. What a great guy. He brought me some serious homemade uh moonshine and an unbelievable hamburger <laughs> thank you brother i love you there, 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 there you go hey uh let me take um a sponsor break here for a couple minutes yes if, if you need to take a a breath of air or get you know give me give me like five ten minutes and let, let me uh you need, bro. let me knock it and we'll come back and we'll talk some more about what's happening these days and and uh we'll just we'll just keep uh, beating the drum all right all right buddy see you in a few Yes, sir. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And our guest today is our good friend, Mr. Laser Lloyd. And I'm really excited and honored to have him on the show. 
He's a centerpiece. Uh, one of the centerpieces of my new film, The Jews in the Blues, uh, it, which is on the festival circuit now. I'm heading to Germany tomorrow to screen it. And then I'm going to Israel to screen it. And uh, it's going to be playing in a lot of places. You're going to hear about it. Finally, got this one out and uh, super excited. Yes, Chris Contos, of course. And, and it means a lot that you're here, Chris, and that, that everybody's enjoying this. You know, it, it, it means a lot to me to know with this show that we could do some different things once in a while. You know, we don't have to have, you know, uh, just super hard rock, you know, guys and gals on the show all the time. And that, that, that the fan base will, will, will go and, and we'll do, we'll do other stuff and, and we'll, we'll discover other cool things. So uh, it means a lot. Yeah. Thank you. It means a lot. It really does. Uh, because for me, I need to do things differently too. I want to talk to different people also. Uh, we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics. <coughs> Excuse me. New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, D Generation Retros, Ch Generation Records, Chacho's Tacos, Grunge and Grime Soap Company, and 126 Hardcore Clothing. It's a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. <coughs> Get in touch with them and ramp up your game at www.126clothing.com. <coughs> Excuse me. That said... I want to talk to you about a new product that I really, really back. And that is something new. Who's ready for something new? All right. I know you are. This, my friends, are you ready for this? This is chickpea. Chickpea is a, a, it's a chickpea-based non-dairy yogurt. It's vegan. It's gluten-free. It's packed with protein and amino acids. This is a chickpea-based non-dairy yogurt. It's just coming out on the market now. Flavors strawberry, yummy vanilla, yummy blueberry, and plain. And let me tell you something. The reason, there's a reason that these are empty is because I, I binge ate them all in, in one shot. So... They need to send me some more. It's, there's no dairy, absolutely no compromise, just satisfying plant-based deliciousness. Listen, I'm not getting heavy with you and, and dropping on your head, you know, eh, plant-based. This is just a really great product. Um, it's made with the creamy, dreamy magic of chickpeas. Listen, we've talked about this before. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a chickpea eating machine. Not that this tastes like hummus because it does not. But it is, it's probiotic to promote a healthy gut and a happy body. It's, it's GMO-free, gluten-free for all you gluten-free. It's soy-free and vegan. They just launched it in New York City. Uh, check out their store. There's a store locator at chickpeafoods.com. You can spell it C-H-K-P, foods.com. Some of the store locations are in Manhattan. Key food on Amsterdam and 89th Street in my neighborhood. Brooklyn, Windsor Farms and Prospect Far and Park. Uh, Dumbo Market in Dumbo. Queens uh, City Fresh Market in Astoria. Astoria, Queens represent. Locations in Long Island and New York in, in, in New Jersey. Shouting out Chickpea. You're going to hear more about them. I love this product. I can back this product. Um, where do we buy this? Um, like I said, I, you know what? I know you're down. I know you're ready. <laughs> Nikki. All right, good. And you, you want it. We'll get it to you, man. It's just coming out on the market now. It's super yummy. Um, right? It, it's up here right now, uh, Ackerman. I don't think it's down in Tallahassee, Florida yet. But, uh, but we'll look into it. So there you go. Chick, chickpea uh, on the move. Uh, it's super excited to have them on board. Also. Our tried and true friends uh, at Chacho's Tacos, located in Corpus Christi, Texas. Chacho's Tacos opened the doors in 2001 
home of the almighty Chacho's Taco. They cook up an incredible home-style Tex-Mex food, and this month they're celebrating their 21st anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning. In their own, in, in their own words, we ain't stopping anytime soon. Swing by and get a home-cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos. We got you. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. Last but not least, <clears throat> last but not least, Generation Records. Generation Records. Generation, since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email Generation Records at gmail.com. Follow them on Facebook and on Instagram. That said want to also mention the next next four shows coming up don't be scared coming up coming up baba bing sunday speaking of bada bing sunday july 3rd is the godfather film retrospective with don capria He's the author of Columbo, The Unsolved Murder. He was also a, a drummer in Scarhead. Guy's got some credentials. Sunday, July 10th, Johnny Ru Rua. I always I pronounce it wrong. Johnny Raw? It's, I know it's not Rua. I got to get this straight. I'm sorry, Johnny. Uh, Street Dogs, Roger Moret, The Disasters, The Bruisers, True Intentions, and Slapshot. Sunday, July 17th, Mr. Nate Newton from Converge, Jesuit, Old Man Gloom, Doom Riders, Cave-In, and the Cavalera Conspiracy, who, by the way, Max and Igor played here in town last night. I heard it was crushing. They did the first two Sepultura records. I heard it was really great. Rio, right. Thank you. I'm sorry. That's it. Johnny Rio. No, you didn't miss the Castle Heights show. The Castle Heights show imploded on itself. Doesn't look like there's going to be a Castle Heights show. Um, Wednesday, July 20th, Cat Popper from Puss in Boots, Ryan Adams, Jesse Mallon, Grace Potter, Willie Nelson, and Jack White. Another side trip show, much like our show today. She is an incredible bass player, and we are looking forward to having her on the show. Uh, you know, I also want to mention... Hopefully I get back from Europe for this. If, if, if I'm not back, it's going to happen anyway. The next New York Hardcore Chronicles proudly presents the Back to the New York Hardcore Roots Music Series show is going to be in our beloved Tompkins Square Park. Get your shoes and socks on, kids. It's right around the corner. Clank your chains and count your change. Rebelmatic, Enziguri, Silence Equals Death, Cropsy and Fire is Murder, Sunday, June 12th, whether I get back from Israel or not, that show is happening. I might end up like Laser Lloyd. I might go to Israel and never come back. I'd still do my show from Israel. I'd be a little bit out of the mix, though. Um, the next Bowery Electric show, June 26th, it is our debut show, Incendiary Device. Uh, also, uh, DJ Sid the Kid, Sewage. Blackout Shoppers, Inhuman, and Sword Enemy. This is going to be a banger, a banger of a show. At our Bowery Electric, it's free. It's all ages. If it's free, it is for me. That said, I think we are good. Let me just reshuffle the deck here. Um, and let's bring our get. Yeah, it is a banger, right? Uh, shout out to Generation Records. Found some great vinyl and stoked. Yeah, it was a great event, and it was great to see you and, and Mandy there. Um, in, Man in Manhattan. In Manhattan. There you go. What's up, Paris? There you go. Um, let's bring our guest back on, Mr. Laser Lloyd. What's up, bro? <laughs> Who's 
Hunter G. Crawford. Hey, thanks, and a big shout out to my brother Laser Lloyd. Oh, Sweetwater, Texas, on the line. Is that right? Oh, Hunter G. Crawford is the next Johnny Cash. The guy is just like the real country blues. You can't believe this guy. Woo, Hunter G. Crawford. That's awesome. Love you, brother. That's great. So, so you're in Israel. Um, you know, you're in a couple of ensembles, and then and then you make you make a go at it on your own as a solo artist. Tell us, tell us about a little bit, you know, those early days and, and your journey. So, you know, I was, you know, my dad had always uh, put the family before business, even though he was a successful lawyer in the insurance business. I remember him, his friends telling him, hey, Joel, you know, you could be going way high, buddy, but you got to go on more of these conferences. I remember dad saying, ah, oh, you know, that's okay. I just, I'm the family's first. We'll make a living, but family's first. So, you know, music was going well, but I could not afford to just go and do my solo thing. I was playing this backup and, and guitar for a lot of people while I was building my name. And then I just waited for the right time when I could just leave all the projects. And I was playing. Someone had heard the Yud album, this lady, uh, Yo, out in Chicago had heard the Yud album. She was totally blown away. She became a fan. And then I was playing backup guitar in Chicago for somebody from Israel. I, I was on tour doing some of my own shows and with him. And so she came to the show and she was totally blown away. She met me. She said, listen, uh, I want to give it a shot. I want This is uh, in 2000, around 2012, um, 13. She says, I think the world needs to hear Laser Lloyd, and I want to do it. So Yo Sideman, she ended up putting together um, lo lots of love records. Right. And she just did an unbelievable job. She, you know, she the first album came out uh, in 2015. I think maybe the Inside Out came a little bit earlier. And uh, she just put the name on the map, and she just been putting the pedal to the metal. And... Uh, you know, eight albums later, I think we have maybe even more. I don't know between the live and the studio. I think it's we're at eight, and and it all comes out on Lots of Love Records. Yeah, Lots of Love Records. There was one album released before I met Yo on Blues Leaf Records out of Deal, New Jersey. Um, that's a great album. It's called Lost on the Highway. And then there's the yeah. original yeah, Lazy Boy album, one. which is Higher Ground. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, you're about the last guy I thought that was gonna cut uh, that was gonna cut his hair, man. I must say. <laughs> well, I'm always surprises. I'm always changing my my look, my outfit, my hats. I'm always on a spiritual journey that's continuing to grow, and uh, I didn't really plan it. You know what happened? My hair got really long. I had this long ponytail, it was almost down to my butt, and I had young uh, two teenage daughters. That we went away, last summer, we went away for a few days. I rented a house. I had a pool. And they're like, Dad, you look homeless. Your hair is down to your butt. Oh, you, you, oh your, daughter, your daughter pulled your card, bro. So what happened was I, you know, I was very sensitive. Because, you know, the teen, my, I had been through some teenagers before. But the, people don't know how hard teenagers were hit in COVID. Mm -hmm. Teenagers are the, that's my gr first grandson, uh, Yonatan. That must wow. be about. Wow, you got grandkids? Yeah, that's my first one. That's Yonatan. Wow. Yeah, I got two of them. Yeah. <laughs> how many kids you? How many kids you have? Five. I got five kids, two grandkids. I got two of my oldest kids are married, but mm -hmm. the younger ones, the younger two girls, are you know the COVID was very hard on teenagers, so I really am sensitive. And I didn't realize that they feel well, you're going out, Dad. Where, you know, I was I was getting the hint. You know, I never, I'm never like anyone or look like anyone. I don't, it's not because I purposely try to do it. I just don't fit in any box. I've never fit into that up to a box. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But then I, so I said, okay. So I said, okay. I grabbed my ponytail after the shower. I said, cut off a few centimeters of my ponytail if it makes it, you feel good. So she says, no, dad, you don't do it like that. You got to first take a brush, comb your hair. So I'm not going to start arguing. So she takes a brush. She combs my hair. She grabs it, the whole thing, and she cuts it. 
and it looked like someone put a bowl around my head. <laughs> my wife, she flips out. She says, you got to go tomorrow to the barber and have him fix that. I said, I haven't been to a barber in 28 years. I don't even know where to find a barber. She says, you're going to find one tomorrow. <laughs> wow. So, so I go to the guy and I say, listen, you got to fix this. You got to fix this. He says, bro, I can't fix it unless I make it really short. So I said, listen, whatever you got to do. So he makes he makes this short haircut with this long beard. And he says, I don't want to tell you what to do, but it looks kind of funny. This, so, you know, I just... I got to tell you that my spiritual journey, it took me in the last few years that I'm in a place where you really have to be careful to get caught up thinking you're some persona, you're some dude, Laser Lloyd, you're some rock blue star, you're some, the exterior, you, you know, you really have to be careful to always keep it down to earth. Absolutely. And, you know, I was, I was, I, I had a dream a few months before, a really weird dream. I woke up sweating, woke up that I had the whole beard got cut off. But at this point, I was like, you know what? I was so happy to just do it because it's not really good where people get. I always tell people, you know, what my spiritual teachers, whenever there would become time where their their bodies had the their souls had to leave the body and the students would get upset, they would always say, are you serious? Don't get attacked. Me is not my body. My essence is not the body. Don't get attached to that. That's not what I've taught you. So I was really excited, even though I, I would, I don't think I would have possibly on my own come up with it, you know, because I don't really put an emphasis on the externals. So I don't think I really would have like designed a new look or anything. <laughs> right, right. But something in life, you have to be a good surfer. You kind of have to feel yeah. the signs of what life, where life is taking you. And I didn't realize, but, you know, I had a lot of people that thought I was this Jesus freak from the mountains of West Virginia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I am a Jesus freak. That is one of my things. That is part of who I am. You know, the real, I'm not a fan of Christianity in its institutionalized form, but the deep teachings of Jesus are, are, are no different than the deep Hasidic teachings or the deep teachings of Buddha or the deep teachings of Krishna or anything. But I, I wasn't realized that it was ice. Today, the world is so isolated. I didn't realize how isolated the look can make you from a yeah. certain type of people. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, because the, the message of my music is very open, worldly, spiritual, and I'm, I'm, I'm a peacemaker. I'm trying to have people open up their minds and just get in touch with you know listening to people they don't agree with i saw this coming in america before 2016 i wrote the song america trying to bring the fanatical right and fanatical left together i saw this train wreck happening i was really nervous and that's when i started doing these sunday live things on facebook and instagram and youtube trying to bring people together so my message was one thing but you didn't i didn't realize that for other people it just you know it isolated them from listening and to what I was saying. And then all of a sudden, I'm seeing a whole new um, bunch of people who are able to con connect to me because, unfortunately, the world is a very exterior thing. The look and yes. visually, people make opinions very quickly. So now it's just, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I just, uh, I just have to go. I'm riding the wave. And I can't tell you what's going to be the next second or the next tomorrow because the only real thing that's happening is right now. And I'm so blessed to be here with my best soul buddy, Drew Stone. Wow. Anyone who knows Drew Stone, when you're hanging out with Drew, the <laughs> energy is super electric. It's super happening. And so, uh, well, thank you. Going on. Hey, you know, look, look, look who one of your big fans is chiming in here. Uh, I'm talking about Mr. Arnie Stone. Hi, Laser. Good to see you. You are my hero. Arnie is my hero. I love that guy. <laughs> From the first second I met him, I said, you know, people who have been around the block and seen the world, they really are the cool people. They know what's going on. And your dad has seen a lot. And yeah. as soon as I, 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 when I could just smell those type of people, that they really are the depth. They know the depth of the world just from all their experience. 
and it just uh, I'm just so blessed that I got to meet Dad. You know. Yeah, he's a big he's a big fan of yours, and uh, <laughs> yeah, the Stone family. You know, yeah. Shout out to Artie Stone. Uh, abs absolutely. Um, you know, you saw me at, at my most successful recording studio ever. Remember when you came to West Haven, Connecticut? Yeah. Yeah, we yeah, and and I have all we 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 um you know what you know what that that recording play session it. never play got it. released. Play it, play it. Oh really? Just just the beginning of it. Okay. One of my favorites. Porn. Sometimes I lose, I lose myself. myself. Sometimes, Sometimes I confuse myself. myself. Is this the life that I dreamt of? She's the one that I always loved. Torn. Don't know what to do. So torn about loving you, and I'm torn. It's always been hard to decide. Some say it's just living, others say it's just life. Being torn, and I am torn. Excellent. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, that version never got released. But in that studio, the only thing that ever <laughs> really got us on the map. One day we made a recording there, and at the last minute, I said, "Can I just do one more song?" He said, "You got. You can do it in one take." So I did this song that I wrote. It was called "The Back Streets," about the back streets of America, just trying to get the people in the cities to understand that all the people in Kentucky and Georgia and Tennessee. They're not all racist, backwards, you know, people like you see in the news. And I just wanted, I, I really wanted people to understand this song. So anyway, in one take, it was an acoustic take, and it was the first hit that we had on the Spotify. It got on a Spotify playlist, but it happened in that studio right where you were standing, brother. <laughs> that was, it was like this. That 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 old timey studio in Connecticut has a lot of has a lot of mojo. That place and that dude that, that dude that engineered that dude had, that had a lot of mojo. In oh that yeah, place. my buddy Vic. He made a lot yeah. of hit big names. Yeah, big names. yeah, yeah. Vic you. Steffens, awesome dude. Vic Steffens. Now, Horizon was, Studios. Yeah, and, and where was that? New Haven. West Haven. West Haven. Not to be confused with New Haven. <laughs> Twenty minutes from Toads. Right. Is this uh, David Ivory with you here? Oh, that's where we recorded America. And we're, that's where we're releasing some of the upcoming singer-songwriter album. Unbelievable producer David Ivory from David mm -hmm. Ivory Music. He helped me so much, you know. He gave me some real good advice because my career was really blossoming. But we were doing half band shows. You know, I got a great band out in Tulsa and half solo shows. And it was hard. And, you know, we were thinking about maybe getting the tour bus and it's time to do it. And he told me, Laser, I want to tell you, the first thing that breaks a good project is the tour bus. <laughs> and he told me, he said, listen, you play so great. You got the personality. You got acoustic guitar, even your electric with your looper. Just go out and connect. You got the songs. Just go out. You don't have to bring the band. Make sure you're not. You know what? He saved me because... Right before COVID, we were about to book some huge, oh man, huge stuff. Oh, we got friends from Brazil here. Hey, Ruth, we got <laughs> friends from. We we're about to book, and you know, it was very complicated for all. When you book a band for like a six month tour, it's it. You know, even if this is from, let's say, divine intervention, COVID. What do you, these people? You lock them in. Sure. It's, it was so complicated. What are you going to do? You have yeah. these people. You, you got to be responsible. Sure. So we were just so lucky. I told the manager, I said, listen, my gut is telling, listen to David. We got to keep going. Some solo projects. Don't get that tour bus yet. 
because a lot of my buddies, listen, you remember this great guy? What's his name? I can't even remember his name. Wow, he's such a good country guy that was give me, breaking give me, through. Give me a clue. He just produced Tyler Childers. And, oh, God, how could I not remember him? He's from Kentucky. Anyway, he was really big, breaking through. Oh, shoot, the name's on the tip of my tongue. I'm looking it up. He produced Tyler Childers. And, oh, I feel so bad that I don't know him. He's such an amazing talent. Sturgill? David Sturgill? Sturgill. Sturgill Simpson. Yeah. Yeah, he was huge. He was touring. His name was out. And look, that flow, that cash flow, that thing, all of a sudden, it killed a lot of big projects, you know? Sure. A lot. What happened was a lot of the big guys are still going, but a lot of the people who were just breaking through in their middle range, people have no idea how hurt those people got because sure. they're just the records were going on. They're, they have to get all that money to come back to them. So I, you know, I just we just got lucky that we kept it the ship tight, and uh, my yeah. manager's done an unbelievable job of keeping the revenue going. Like just with you with the Patreon and all these fans that just your, your manager, your manager, your manager's your manager's great, and and she's driven yeah. and she's all in, and uh, you know she she really uh, she's a pleasure to deal with, and and I think that's just you know part of it, part of the part of the allure. You know, yeah. Um, but uh, what's going on here? That's not me. That's somebody wearing no. the Laser Lloyd T-shirt. Okay, uh, I, I thought this is looks this, like Formula One. It looks like a car racer. I was just wondering if this is if he's involved. I with... got a few good. You know, people are in other places doing good things. That you know became Laser Lloyd fans. You know, a lot of my music gets played with after Cody Jinx. And you know Chris Staple did in those circles, so you yeah. know I got a lot of fans that move over. Well, one one thing you mentioned is Brazil, and and I happen to know because we we've talked about this. You have an incredible fan base. Hey, what's up, Bra Vinny? You have an incredible fan base in Brazil, right? So I had a few fans. You know, Brazilians they are huge music fans. Yeah, they're very warm. They love the type of music I do. But what happened was I had this one song, "Forget the World." Uh -huh. That I I don't want to get into the whole thing, but it was a very terrible thing that happened here in Israel. It was really heartbreaking, and I, at the same day I have to play this happy occasion. So in the song in the in the sound check, this also happened to me with tears and for Dick, I wrote it in the sound check. I'm I, I'm I'm just like writing a melody to empty out my heart. You know this. wanted to just forget the world and so the next day i played it on facebook it was like a, it was the time to do it i played it on facebook and one of the fans wrote back man listening to this song i really they wrote me back in portuguese i forget the world Escustas do mundo mm -hmm. so my manager decided she said hey let's put it up and let's make the title Escustas do mundo so all of a sudden we got one song in um and um, it's, it has millions of views now. It was in Portuguese. So all of a sudden, the, the people from Brazil, I mean, I've never seen this. You can, I, I've never seen any <laughs> video on YouTube that has like 4 million views, but thousands of comments. I mean, you go on there, it's got yeah. thousands. It, it, people say the song changed the, their lives. It, it, it's, it, it was, it is no words, but there's something that happened there. And so Brazil, and then they just got started going into all my music. Next thing I know, so it's just been a beautiful thing. So many friends and fans. Have you, been, have you been to Brazil and played? We were working on it, but we were just yeah. about to really seriously go right before COVID. And mm -hmm. then they got ser seriously hit there. Yeah. So I'm hoping soon because lots of great, beautiful fans there and lots of unbelievable musicians. Some of my musical heroes in college and jazz, you know, Jobin and all these people were from there, you know. Hey, what's the Inside You podcast and the Inside You book? Okay, so Inside You is that for many, many years through my spiritual journey with the Buddha and Native American Indians and the mystical Hasidic teachings and the, the Indian teachings and Sri Ramana Maharshi, 
I, I came up all of a sudden with this song one day where all of a sudden it came to me that whatever I am inside, whatever it is, it is where I call it the it. It's not a thing. It's not a name. It's not a person. It's not somewhere else. You that is inside you, and you are inside it, and it is not dual, it's non dual, it's just all the time. And then I found these teachings. I could, I, I found teachings that were, were like pointing to it, but then all of a sudden, I found some teachers. As I'm always just asking, I said, Listen, I don't know, I was feeling these own things on my own from my own experience, and I, I've always told people, you know. Books are beautiful, but really, you better rely on your own hard experience if you want the real deal. And so the real healing of the world, I decided, is that the answers are inside you. But we need the holy teachers that know they don't want you to be them. They don't want you to have external knowledge. They want you to learn how to connect to the real you. So that was what my teachings have been for the last few years. And the music is all about just, you know, you don't have to call what you are a certain name. Don't get caught up in any cult or any specific institutionalized religion, even though they some of them have good things. But the main thing is experience it by going inside you. And when you go inside you, that experience, if you can still your mind and experience what is it that's experiencing this physical manifestation in this body, you have to draw the conclusion that that is what is in everyone else. And then you just understand that what you're seeing all the time is yourself. And you're not, it's not something separate from you. And then you have to juggle how I'm this individual laser Lloyd, let whatever is manifesting through me, it wants to use laser Lloyd, Drew Stone, it's manifesting through stone and it wants to have these special Drew Stone qualities. So at the same time, we're the oneness. We don't, the beauty is that we're not the same. And that's the problem of the politics and institutionalized religions who are trying to take away the beauty of the creator, which is this most universal, diverse thing. The beauty of the forest is not to all the trees are the same. It's the, it's the beauty of all the different things. And so that we have to get back and just learn how to be our, our our unique way that's never disconnected from the whole. And I just think the world's been, through politics, through religion, you know, it's cool. I totally love the way Drew Stone is Drew Stone. And I, I would not, that energy, that personality, the world needs that. The world needs it, needs that. So you have to, we are learning how to juggle, how to be that manifestation while at the same time knowing that your eternal thing, because the Drew Stone body personality thing is constantly changing, won't be here forever. But what is the thing that's forever mm. inside? And so that's what the Inside You song and the the book and the, the podcast and things are about. And uh, I don't have the answers, folks, but you know what? <laughs> I've been so blessed to meet so many beautiful people who have just really, I mean, I mean, I am. People always say, "Oh, laser, you're the you're smart." You're the, I said, "Listen, I only do one thing." Milt Hinton said, "If you do more listening than speaking off the stage and on the stage, you're going to be blessed." And I just have met so many people, just like you, have taught me so many things. I'm telling you, I've met cleaning ladies in the hotels. If you hear Laser Lloyd say something good, you know, I make the cleaning ladies. These are my family because sometimes I'm a few days at the hotel and I, I see these people and, and we become family. And if you want to know people who know some wisdom, these people go inside the rooms of the rich, the poor, the famous, the see they're working. And if you, you speak to them. So I learned when I met this homeless person, if I never spoke to that homeless person, my life would be so different 28 years ago. And from that moment, I said, oh, my gosh, all the people who are really holding the deep secrets, they're not the people on the news or in Hollywood or even on the pulpit. It's a lot. Most of the time, it's these people who we just pass by and we forget to listen to them. And, and so I just bless everyone, wherever you go, 
to have your heart open to learn things from other people and uh you know so that's just really i've been blessed to just meet a lot of beautiful people you know um i saw once when when i was with you uh i think it was here in new york um and i've seen other people do this as well but um <clears throat> when you entered into the club when you entered into the room you spent the time and introduced yourself to the bar back to the sound guy to to like every single person um that was like you know not not just not just the guy that was putting the show on but you took the time and were gracious enough to introduce yourself to like you know the bar back the sound guy the the gal the the the, the bartender and then you shouted them you shouted them you shouted them out from the stage at the end of your set and uh i thought that was really unique and and really heartfelt and and i think it, it really uh, said a lot about you know your persona and how you treat people yeah you know my my I, I got that naturally from my mother whoever she met if it was someone would come into the house to do anything if it was someone it was someone cleaning or was someone mowing the lawn someone with the garbage guys picking up they all became part of our family that's just the way i was raised so i can't really take too much credit for that but just i just felt every atmosphere to make sure you keep humble and realizing for me these nightclubs the bar i, I I'm, I'm 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 in the bar that's my life and i realized yeah. that the bar is also a holy atmosphere and and everybody working there is making the show and everyone there uh you know has a story and these people are really important and uh yeah you know, Oh, yeah. well, I'm just learning. It's still a long way to go, but we try to keep it down to earth and keep it. Home. Well, it's yeah. also something we touch on in the film, which is for a lot of people, music, to a certain extent, is their spirituality, and it is the it is the the bond. It is the 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 the, the tie that binds us together, and that's music, right? That's it. That's it, brother. Uh, you yeah, did man. such an unbelievable job with the movie. I thanks. I loved. The screening, I love yeah, everything. It was great to there. have you. It was great to have you be, be a part of it. Yeah. Hey, so uh, let's um let me take my last sponsor break for a couple minutes, and we'll come back and we'll take some questions from around the world. Okay. Awesome, bro. I'll be jamming my guitar for a while. All right. Be right back. There you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. Our guest is the one, the only Laser Lloyd. We are sponsored by the Organic Grill, the Texas Silver Rush. DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, Grunge and Grime, Soap Company, and, come on now, New York Hardcore Comics, our first and still one of our most solid sponsors. New York Hardcore opened back in 2013, selling comic books, punk rock, and hardcore memorabilia, toys, statues, skateboard decks, tapes, vinyl, and all things horror. We love helping bands push their demos and new tracks, so please stop by and drop off your new music. We have in-store events like Magic the Gathering and Warhammer tournaments, plus meet and greets with bands and some live performances. Open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Find us online through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and eBay, located at 117 Main Street in lovely Dobbs Ferry, New York, www.newyorkhardcorecomics.com. Um, if, you, if you are in, let's just say, for some crazy reason, you happen to be in Gottingen, Germany on Saturday. I will be there too. How crazy is that? I will be there as well. And doing a screening of my new film that I co-directed with my brother, Evan B. Stone. Arnie Stone was the executive, is the executive producer. Uh, it is the European premiere of The Jews in the Blues, Saturday, June 4th at Cinema Melee's in Göttingen. I'm doing a Q&A, a post-screening Q&A with myself and Robert and uh, Nicole, the two executive producers. So please, if you are in, if you are in that part of the world, we'd love to see you. Also, um, Sunday, July 24th, just a heads up, we have another free all-ages Bowery Electric show. 
with Sub-Zero, Kings Never Die, Brick by Brick, Dead Crew, and Mad Mulligans. It is Scott Dotino's birthday bash, Sunday, July 24th at the Bowery Electric. It's If it's free, you know it is for me. Also want to shout out Sunday, August 14th. It is the Run Amok Fest. <laughs> yes, it is the Run Amok Fest. Sunday, August 14th with RBNX, United Blood NYC, featuring Sid the Kid, Necrotic Society, Damn Your Eyes, The Car Bomb Parade, The Pride of Staten Island in Rage, and Leeway NYC, featuring Eddie Sutton. That is Sunday, August 14th. Come on down. Bring the wife and kids. It is all ages. Don't forget, too, you're going to hear a lot more about Chickpea, my new favorite. Yo, I, I could just... I could just live on this. Like if they, just, I could just live on this stuff. That's how good it is. Uh, once again, want to shout out uh, patrons. My latest patron, Philip Herman, and uh, who, wait, who signed on today? Wait, I crazy. Yo, what's up, Terrence Cullinane? Thank you, my latest, latest uh, patron. Just came on board. Just when we started this show. Listen. We're heading up on, on show 200. Um, that's happening with Evan Seinfeld. There's the Patreon address. Please support the show. Um, if, if you, there's a, there's a PayPal address there. That's what keeps, that's what keeps it running. Um, yes. Brick by brick. Yep. Yep. Uh, buddy cage. Wow. Yeah. Any questions, <coughs> any questions for laser Lloyd? Please post now. I know people have have been asking questions since the beginning, but you know, let's get loose. Uh, let's ask Laser some questions. Uh, let's bring him back on. Um, <coughs> let me clear the deck. Laser Lloyd, what's up? Yo, yo. <laughs> how's, how's the weather in Israel? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, bro? Here's I, I said, where's the how's the weather in Israel? I'm gonna be there in a couple days. Wow, it just cooled down a little bit today. I was practicing on the porch, it was 85 at night. I've been sleeping on the porch, it's so beautiful. The night times get down like 60, 65. You know, last week we had some hot days, but the beautiful thing about Israel is never boring. The weather is always changing, even when it's hot, it's not too hot. And, uh, you know, we're doing good, you know. You, you live in, in uh, Bet Shemesh, right? Now, Bet uh, Shemesh. Be, right. Bet, Bet Shemesh. It, it translates to the house of the sun. Now, the Scuttlebutt is, it's sort of like a very groovy place that's sort of, is that like where a lot of like, I don't want to say hippies, but it's sort of like a very, um, it's pretty loose, and, 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 and people say it's a great place to live. Well, I mean, it's got a whole combination of things, you know. Um, if people who don't know Israel, Israel is so diverse. You have, yeah, so you can have like one neighborhood can be ultra orthodox, the next sure. neighborhood can be um, um, people from Morocco and, and like this. And then where I'm living is kind of very open minded, more. Uh, you know, uh, English speakers, but it's very mountainous, beautiful in the mountains. Like five minutes from here, I go jogging. It's like Colorado, and it's very beautiful. It's pretty quiet, but mainly it's the middle of the country, so I can get pretty much to any gig mm. within, you know, the furthest yeah. I would have to go would be four-hour drive. That would be the farthest, and so I'm right in the middle of wherever right. I have to go. I'm like 40 minutes Jerusalem, 40 minutes Tel Aviv. If it's traffic, it's an hour each one. Right. And, and uh, but I like the mountain town and, uh, you know, it's if it's diverse. You can go to some neighborhoods here. It's like being in Williamsburg. Yeah. Anyone knows what Williamsburg, Brooklyn is. You can go to some neighborhoods here and you'll just feel like you're somewhere in, you know, maybe Indiana. See people just, uh, you know, let's take a question from Ray Hogan. Did Louisiana play into your blues journey? Uh, Lay Raphael Neal, Lazy Kester, Earl King, Snooks, Eglaninik. 
Well, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, the biggest way Louisiana mixed in is, I'm not positive, but I think John Fogarty is from the Swamplands. And John Fogarty is a huge influence on me, the singing, the songwriting, and the playing. I just put out Green River, a version, my own version of Green River the other day, and I always put some CCR. Uh, People do not realize how big CCR were, bigger than the Beatles. When the Beatles were at their height, there was a six-month period where CCR was more on the radio and bigger album sales than the Beatles. So that, But he was mixing in into his blues and into his rock and into his psychedelic, a lot of that swamp stuff. You know what I'm saying? Sure. That's really it's really interesting and poignant because the last show I did was with Greg Hetson, who's the guitar player for Bad Religion and Circle Jerks. And he cited the first Credence record as the as the record that inspired him to pick up and play guitar. And here's a punk rock icon. It just goes to show that that you know it's it it it, it speaks to it speaks to people on all different levels. It's amazing how you get folk, country, pop. There is a punk element, psychedelic, swamp. Yeah. And CCR music is just like, it's such a shame that they broke up, so, you know, early. They had, you know, that whole ego thing was tough between the brothers, you know. Yeah, those guys really, those guys really, yeah. really went at it. Let me ask yeah. you, uh, let me ask you about this guitar here. What's happening? Yeah. Is this, is this the this cigar box guitar? Explain, explain this to us. That is an unbelievable story. Um that's a big part of my life is these beautiful guys, you know, people always, you know, when you start making it, people want to just, you know, want to either try to make off of you or get something off of you. So I get all these people who are making guitars or brands selling me all these things. (laughs) I get one day this letter from these guitar guys, Morgan garage guitars in Dayton, Ohio. They say, laser, we love the way you play. We're sending you a guitar box guitar. If you like it, you can play it. If you don't, you can keep it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there I was playing a show right over the border in Sarnia, Canada, and it gets delivered, the first version of it. I open up, and I thought I wasn't able to do anything because I don't know how to play a uh, four-string cigar box, but this was six strings. And ah. the thing, amazing sound. The first video went viral. And then we actually, we because of them, we made a show in Dayton, Ohio. And the thing went viral. Me playing the first time I touched, met the guys. They brought um, Black Betty. There she is. Mm-hmm. And and she just became a star. The sound is unbelievable. The guy never played guitar in his life. He said he just sat in his basement, was in love with Lifekin Hopkins, tried to make a model. And he says he thinks I'm the guy to play it. And we just became best friends. So I just, you know, sent a lot of to my buddies, John and Larry out in Morgan Garage Guitars and a lot of great fans in Dayton, Ohio, in the Ohio area. And then that's that guitar there. When you when you play when you're playing slide, are you are you what are you tuned to E or to e, to A? Sometimes I do it regular tuning. Right? Just standard sometimes E. Sometimes I do sometimes I do open D, sometimes I do open, open. G. Open G. Yeah. Wow. Sometimes I got a few different tunings I use. It depends what tune it is, you know. You ever cross paths with Johnny Winter in Connecticut? Wow, not in Connecticut, but it's part of my story. When I was in college, I got to warm up for Johnny Winter. Wow. And yeah, it was in Glen Falls, this biker bar. Wow. My friends, my friend worked at the place, said it was my band, Chapter 11. He said, You guys are going to come warm up. Johnny Winter. That's awesome. I got to see him backstage, but I was afraid to go into the room. You know, I didn't want to bother him. I was just like, you know. Yeah. The next person I got to warm up, it was 1987. I had the be- the famous band on college. So they say, hey, we want you to warm up this dude. I won't give you his name. It, they said he said, yeah, he's like kind of like a, a a pop pop artist, like dance pop. You probably won't like the music, but, you know, can you guys warm up for him? I said, okay. So we warmed up. It was the big green. You know, we were really not so good, but, you know, all your friends tell you how great you were. You go downstairs, you have some beers. I Uh come out totally smashed, thinking, who's this loser pop band going to be? I see about 3,000 people close to the stage, and there I see Prince playing Purple Rain with that white guitar. It was Prince. 
Wow. He played this guitar solo for like seven minutes to Purple Rain. He was a great guitar player. Uh, people have, I mean, since Jimi Hendrix, yeah. I never heard anyone that could do what Prince could do. And yeah. I never heard anyone, I never heard anyone since. Yeah, I mean, and, and what to see it live, yeah. I remember the moment. First of all, I, all my ego just went right to the floor. I thought I knew how to play something. I thought, I, just within three notes, I heard a Prince. I said, I got to go back to the drawing board. Well, I, I, I don't know if it's still in your set, but of course I've seen you play many times. And for a while you were playing a great rendition of Purple Rain. You were closing you were closing your shows with it, right? Yeah, I do. I, I still, still feel very connected to Prince. And I think he was... That's interesting. It's amazing if you listen to his final album that was released only after he was dead, thinks he was a pro. I mean, there's certain things you feel people say that are prophecy. And he was yeah. writing... He was writing things, prophecy of what happened in our last five years in America. Yeah, he was. I he, mean, was he wrote that stuff way before it. And it's it's just blows my mind. Such a deep dude, such a sad story, but so much love was in him and so much music. So and I, and just as a guitar player, it, it, it moves me emotionally every time. I remember playing it in Minneapolis. It just uh, yeah. it was a moving experience. Absolutely. Um... What Chris Contos? Why are you at Chris Contos? Why are you asking about Buddy Cage? Uh, do you have any 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 any, uh, any ever any connection with Buddy Cage, the pedal steel guitar player? The, the well, you know the, the, the was he in Connecticut? Guy? Very familiar. I, is he the guy in Nashville? He plays on all the. He plays. He was in the New Riders of the Purple Sage. He was he was a great slide guitar, a great, great um pedal steel guitar player. He played on a lot of stuff. Now yeah. I think that if you have it, will remind me. I think that. Well, I had a showcase a few years back in Nashville, and they did bring a famous pedal steel guy, and I'm not sure if it was him. I'm not sure if it was him. Oh, but okay. the name Chris, sounds familiar. The, the you know what it is? Familiar. Chris Contos is a San Francisco guy. So, of course, oh, there's, wow. a, there's a connection. Chris Contos is a drummer. He plays he, he played, uh, in Machine Head. He's been in a lot of real big heavy metal bands. He's a big He's a big supporter of the show. But yeah, so he's a San Francisco yeah, that, guy. That's so there's a Grateful Dead and New Riders connection. Oh, you played with him? When did you play with Buddy Cage, Chris? What? Wow. <laughs> All right. So Chris Here's... must know the uh, Hayward Blue Festival. I love that. It's a big uh, festival. It's a great story. I was like the first white artist ever. It's an all-black blues festival. And I played one time up in Fulton, California. And the sound guy who did sound for me was blown away. He actually was one of the organizers. He said, you know what? I'm going to get you to play there. I remember we got a video. I got this huge standing ovation. He says, the first time I have it, and he, he, I remember him saying, folks, because you know what? I want to say something here. It might not be politically correct. But he knew that in the blues scene, and sometimes that black people have a little bit of anti-white or not thinking that white people can play music or the blues. Mm -hmm. There is this element, and my friend Ronnie really likes to break down all the stigmas. And sometimes in the black community, they also get fed sometimes with the Louis Farrakhan thing, this anti-Israel, anti-Jewish yeah. thing. So he purposely brought me on, and they're clapping like crazy, standing ovation. And he says, people, I want you to know lasers from Israel. Now, he was worried <laughs> what would happen to me, so he brought me. They became my best friends. These Hell Angels bodyguards for the festival. Wherever I went with the festival, I had these huge Hell Angels guys watching wow. me. But that was the Hayward Blues Festival for Chris out in San Francisco. Ah. Near, uh, that's in Oakland, near Oakland. But well, that's Francisco, that's, where, that's where. Yeah, Chris is an Oakland guy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I'm from New York City. Okay. Um, here, here's. Wait, let me find this one. So he remembers. Uh, yeah, that I was. Nice. I was just playing the days when Papa Chubby was just breaking through. Me and Papa were playing some of the same clubs. Papa Chubby's an old New York hardcore guy. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, he, he used to be in the band Blood Clot. Um, I'm looking for. Wait, hold on. I'm gonna find this uh, about your your song, um, uh, Oklahoma. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wait. Um, one of my favorite songs. I love that song. Buddy. Yeah, wait, I'm trying to find. 
or, or tell us about Oklahoma. Yeah, and I'll, f I'll find the comment. You know, that was also right, right, you know, in the middle of the Trump era. And, um, you know, people who know Oklahoma, that's one of the that's one of the serious hardcore. You get serious hardcore. People who are Bible Belt, you know, you also get white racist and you get some of those people where at the same time I met people who were just my most beautiful friends were in Oklahoma and everyone knows the, the history of Tulsa or maybe a lot of people don't know but one of the worst things was what happened in Tulsa Oklahoma I, I think about you know so but then I met some really open-minded people in Tulsa in Oklahoma and I, I could see the diversity of really what was happening in America you could see it in Oklahoma where you had this really people who really want to go and make the change and then you have people really super hardcore holding back not wanting to make the change and face the reality of our harsh history uh, and so i i wrote that song where i wanted people to know hey listen not everybody that drives a truck or voted for trump or is proud to be american that doesn't mean they're racist it doesn't mean they're bad people right at the on. same time I, at the, in that song, at the same time, I, I, I speak to the people in a way there of, I'm not telling you what to do, but let's think about it together. Maybe we, what, well, maybe it's time we got to change. Let's think about it. Because if you, people are missing the point in America. If you just keep bashing people over the head with your ideas, no one is going to listen. We have to engage in a way. Let's think about this together. Mm -hmm. let's just listen let's just listen let's think about it together and, and people from the left or right are making making that big mistake yeah. but listen i gotta tell you i played all over the world but specifically in america left or right black and white rich or poor democrat or pump you know america is a beautiful country beautiful people are all over they're not all in one city they're not all in one color they're not all in one political party so I, I'm really, people don't get down by what you see in the news because I got to tell you, anyone who travels around America, don't buy into it, that whole, don't get depressed, our, our, we're crumbling, our thing. We have issues, but America, if you go travel around the world, America is a great place. We still got stuff to fix. So anyway, I, 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 I very feel, uh, because Blues grew up in America and, for Jewish people, we have to understand, with even with the anti-Semitism today, if you put everything in the framework of the big picture, the Jewish people owe so much to America. In those years, the opportunity that has been given, we have to make sure that we do our very best to maintain the to, Jew, to why we're pushing for change, be very... Uh, aware of what America did for Jewish people. And at the same time, the minority communities have to be aware of how much the Jews pushed for the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. The Jews were so involved with, Robert, with, with Martin Luther King and so many of those things that we, ha we have to keep making sure that that gets out there because there are, there are dangerous elements today in the Democratic and Republican parties that you know, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. I see a little anti-Semitism coming and really st from strange places that, that it shouldn't be. Absolutely. The world is uh, the world is sometimes uh, really feels like a very scary place where it's heading, you know, and I'm not I'm not saying you know left or right. But uh, I don't want to, you know, but it, it sometimes it it seems like in a lot of aspects we're going into we're, we're heading down a, a very dark and scary road. You know? Yeah, isolation and, and fanaticism, yeah. whatever yeah. it is, we got to stay away from that. A absolutely. Um, we're winding it down a little bit, but I want to ask you about this. What's this? Is this the Laser Lloyd Big Band here? That is. That was the last <laughs> live we, we filmed it and videotaped it. That's a great story. This is since Janis Joplin. I never heard a lady sing like this lady, Rachel Selfin. This is kind of like the story you were talking about. We were hanging out three years ago playing this place called The Zone in Tel Aviv. 
And this waitress, nice waitress, she came and brought us some drinks. And they said, what's your name? And I, it's being nice. So somebody at the bar said, hey, Lazy, you know that Rachel, she's trying to be a singer. I said, oh, okay. So it was the last song we were recording. This album there, it's a great place to record tracks and video. I said, you know what? I said to myself, let's give this lady a shot. I got off the song list. We, I said, let's call her up. We'll do Knock on Heaven's Door. Let's nice. give her a shot. She didn't even know the words. I'm whispering the words. You can see if you look close at the video. This lady blew away. I mean, it's got 10,000 shares more already on Facebook. But there's a video of her and I and the band singing wow. Knock on Heaven's Door. I've never heard. So we're, we're coming up. We're doing a joint project of uh, a song of mine which is a love ballad. We're doing a duet. And then she did this unbelievable blood, sweat, and tears. Um, you'll never know how much I love you version. We had her come to the, as a reunion to the last show. She's just super amazing. And that unbelievable um, uh, violin player, his name is Nimrod Knoll. We've been friends for years, played different projects. So he adds like this Middle Eastern country feel to some of the psychedelic jams and some of the songs we've been doing. So there is a big, big band version of what I do. And uh, we're, we're trying to get that on some of the stages, but it's going to be released, the video and the music soon. I like that. Playing a Strat, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy yeah. guitar search all the time. Um, let me see. Yeah. So I think we we're, I think we covered a lot, man. That was great. Um but uh, before we before we say goodbye, um, I have to. Uh, I'm wondering if it's possible. Vinny says, "Come on now, Laser, play us out, my brother." Is it on the way out? Can you play us a little something? I can. You know, it's it's twelve almost twelve o'clock uh, here in Israel. My neighbors are yeah, downstairs. I got it. Sleep. No, I'm gonna play a little bit of something. We'll play right. a little bit of blues, uh -huh. but I can't make it too loud. So see if you can hear it. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody you want to shout out, thank on the way out or any, any parting words? Uh, well, I want to tell you that, uh, you know, uh, for sure, yo, yo, and lots of love records done amazing things. I would just like to shout out to every human being in the world that everyone should pray for peace and love. Everyone should be blessed with peace and love. Everyone should know that the answers to all America's problems and the world's problems, Ukraine and Russia is an ego problem from the first time man was made. And the only way to cure it is going to be each one of us going inside, being in tune, self-knowledge of what your own ego has you running after. The more we do this, we will see a world of peace and love. So don't look for quick fixes. There won't be political quick fixes. There won't be none of that stuff. It has to be grassroots starting with me and you. So I bless everybody, whatever it is, if it's gun, mental health, war, poverty, environment, as long as we are taking care of our ego, learning to have self-knowledge, being comfortable, just being in the moment, we will be less materialistic. We will be less judgmental. We will be more loving. We will be out of the box. We will feel the universal one while figuring out what our unique roles are here. And so just blessing everybody to keep like Drew is. Just keep spreading good vibes wherever you may be. And um, God bless you all. I love you, man. And and um, I'm just happy you're, you're in my life. I'm blessed talk, we're put together. I'll talk to you soon. I had a great time, buddy. 
And you're you welcome. better you're... come stay over when you come here. I know you'll be super <laughs> oh, busy. Oh, can, I, can I sleep out on the porch? <laughs> you got to sleep on my porch. It's the only place left. I got a whole bunch of people. <laughs> Oh no no! My daughters are going, and my my son in law are going away to Guatemala. So we'll have some. We'll have a, even a couch inside for you. All right, love I'll you, talk, love you, I everybody. Love you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Woo! <laughs> well, there you have it. You know, it's what we do here. What a great show! And I appreciate everybody hanging with me. You know, Joe Ackerman and Paulie, Chris Contos, man. Wow. Chris Contos putting in time, putting in time the New York Hardcore Chronicles. Yeah, man. Thank you, Chris. It means a lot. You know, Vinny, every everybody, man. It was a you know, Chris Hoffman and, and Tony, everybody, man. It was a, it was a it was a you know, it was a great show. It was a great show. I even saw who did I see chime in there towards the end? I saw Laurent in France chime in. There he is. There you go. Laurent in France. Good to see you, buddy. Um yeah, well, thanks. I appreciate, I appreciate everybody is supporting the show, and I just love doing the show, and um, means a lot that you support me. So I'm heading to uh, Germany tomorrow, and then I'm going to be in Israel, and it's going to be two weeks from today until we're back, which is which is kind of perfect because you know we got Satan on the show next, so it just goes to show what an eclectic mix we have on on the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Hold on. Coming up two weeks from today, episode 199, ruler of hell, swallower of souls, creator of rock and roll. I'm talking about Senor Satan will be on the show. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get your questions ready. There's a lot to talk about with Satan here. Yes, everybody's, everybody's excited about the Satan show. Um, so, so there you go. Um, yeah, what can I say? All right, everybody. Uh, let's go Rangers. Uh, big game tonight. Um, thanks a lot until I see you. If I don't, if I don't see you until two weeks from today, all I ask of you, my friend, is that you do good things and good things will come to you.